Dr. Grant. My dear Dr. Grant, welcome to Jurassic Park. Easily one of the best books I've read and easily a better movie. Although I feel like the movie could have been improved on some of uh, the things in this book because some of it was very dark and uh, I do love my um, dark storytelling and fantasy and all that. And of course, I'm of course a uh, dinosaur lover. I love my dinosaurs. Ever since I was a young lad, I always uh, would have liked to have been a paleontologist. But, um, you know, life doesn't always work out the way, you, the way it does really. But yeah, anyway, today we are here to finally review one of Michael Crichton's most famous works. I will say um, that his way of storytelling is um, right on the dark side, which is, um, you know, her on the dark side of the horse. Uh, but um, I kind of like that. Like, I like that um, it didn't have, like, uh, that sort of, like, PG rating like um, the movie did in a certain sense. Like, it had added more story to it. Of course, the book is always better than the films in my mind because there's just so much more imaginative that can go into it. But anyway, yes. We're here finally to review this book, and uh, it kind of starts out like if uh, if you've all seen like Lost World, it kind of starts out like that, basically, uh, where a young girl is basically attacked by um, a few compies and all that, and uh, basically it like spirals off into like um, doctors and nurses and um, other paleontologists like researching about this so-called uh, compie. They don't know what it is. They think it's either a form of Komodo dragon of some kind because they believe uh, when they tested the um, poison on the young girl's injuries, she's alive of course, thank goodness, um, they found poisonous uh, residue within some of the skin so uh, her skin was rather irritated. So they thought at first it was kind of uh, due to a, a Komodo dragon attack but um, they couldn't really be specific on it although they also had to take the girl's um, retrospective into heart as well because of uh, you know, what she had seen and uh, what had happened to her, really. So they kind of, like, took what she said on board. But it was still hard to believe that uh, a prehistoric creature, such as the Compi, was still alive in a certain sense. And uh, it, we kind of skip forward a little bit. We um, figure out uh, what's going on with um, Dodgson and uh, Nedry. Now, Nedry, easily one of uh, the most likeable, uh, hateable, if that makes any sense, antagonist in the series. He's kind of everything that um, I grew up with, really, in uh, the, the 90s when it came to, like, antagonists. Like, um, you know, you've got, like, the um, slobbish, uh, you know, just pure asshole type that, you know, doesn't care what anybody says or thinks, really. But he's very entertaining to watch and the way he... Um, like, if you've seen him in the movie, how... Um, I can't remember the actor's name, unfortunately, but um, the way uh, the actor plays Nedry, he uh, gets him down to a T, as he does in the book here. I mean, his character does not change in the books when it changes in the film, in a certain sense. I mean, he's a little bit more reserved uh, in the film, but, uh, yeah, I feel like in this one he's more of an arsehole in a certain sense, and uh, that's just perfect. And uh, basically we meet um, Alan and... Uh, Oh, what was her name? I'll call her Sattler for now because I cannot remember her. I believe, I believe it's Emily? Yes, it is. Yes, it's uh, Emily. And uh, they actually don't meet um, uh, Richard Attenborough's character in this, um, John Hammond. They actually um, meet him like somewhere off elsewhere, I believe. I think they meet him in Montana. I think uh, he actually, I think they go to see him because he offers them the opportunity to um, go to the park and like, he can't like be specific on it because uh, he can't give enough details away because of uh, the lawsuit that he's got going on really with, um, you know, with safety and everything that's going on in general really with the park. Uh, he gives them the promise that he will fund their um, digs for another three or four years or so on and so forth, as it's been stated in the film. But uh, it the most of the build up in the beginning is just them trying to figure out the um, compi because they actually dug up a um, compi skeleton themselves in Montana, and uh, 
they were trying to like go back and forth on the attack with the child and the um skeleton to see if it actually did match up with like the prescription uh prescription <laughs> the uh the idea on what the creature looked like that attacked the young child and uh they end up finding out that it was a comfy in a certain sense because uh, of the way the bone structure looked and how the size uh, ratio kind of matched what the child was saying. But anyway, moving on to uh, meeting all the other characters. They uh, meet Ian Malcolm, of course, on the helicopter going towards um, Isla Sauna. Is that Isla Sauna or Isla Nublar? I believe it's Isla Sauna, yeah, that's, that's right, because I think Nublar was um, the third film, I believe, if uh, you've seen that. Uh, that was uh, Site B, I believe, Nublar. Anyway, yes, so uh, they meet Ian. He obviously is um, uh, credited, he's a very well credited mathematician in uh, his field and all that, and uh, I believe they named a specific theory after him. I believe they called it the Malcolm Theory. Or in uh, between you and me, it's just uh, the chaos theory, how everything basically has its place and everything can lose that place and everything changes and, and it loops with one another. Basically, you know what chaos theory is. I don't have to go into full detail for everyone who's watching the video, but yes. Now, what really surprised me in this book is how much they've changed some characters. Well, I, this is the original, basically, this is the original work, but in the film, they've kind of, like, changed some of the characters' behaviours. Ian Malcolm is not much of a, a ladies' man in this. I mean, yeah, he does, like, give um, Dr. Sattler a couple of eyes, and, uh, you know, he flirts with her a little bit here and there, but it's not much, really. Although he's still, like, wearing the old black thing, like, as uh, he did in the movie, really. Kind of the rock style of uh, the mathematician world and all that. Well, the mathematical world. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, John uh, Hammond still hates Ian. He just does not like his character in this because, uh, you know, he's just constantly... I cannot tell you how many uh, pages of this book I've had to um, quickly zim through and then go back to check some of his other lines because all Ian does in this is just tell everyone. And it's because he, no one will listen. He's basically saying that this park will fail with or without the input of its employees or you and so on and so forth basically because that's just been designed for that it's just chaos theory in general and also the fact that you've brought an unknown ecosystem and flora and fauna into the world where humans co inhabit now it's just going to be a problem for both sides really because i don't know how you can understand an ecosystem if you've never researched it or even considered what it would be like for man to even coincide in the same universe as say dinosaurs in a certain sense i mean there are even some plants within the uh, island itself that are just poisonous but they decide to bring them in because they believe they look pretty it's very uh that's pretty much uh, ian's uh standpoint really he's just there to basically tell the reader you know this is all wrong you should not be doing this blah 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 and in this, um, I was kind of taken aback by how um, Hammond uh, reacted. He, they constantly give him like this uh, persona of like, you know, he's shaking his head, like he's believing that everyone else is wrong. Like um, he's very stubborn in his ways. I mean, for being 76, that's not a surprise, but still it doesn't need to stereotype uh, most people just because of old age. It leads them to basically being, um, you know, sort of... Uh, stuck in their own ways in a certain sense but um yeah i don't i didn't really like the way that hammond was handled but i'll get on with that later on in the um, review because um uh he's, he's got quite an interesting bit later on in this book that um i was quite upset about but anyway yes moving on uh we meet the kids uh lex and um tim Tim is about 11 years old, so he's actually slightly older than his sister, Alexa, who is, um, I believe it's either Alexa or Alexi, I'll just call her Alex for now. She's about 8 years old. Quite different, although she's not the hacker, she's actually the sports um, enthusiast in this. Because in the film, she was the one who like hacked the computers to be able to get all the security systems back online and all that. Uh, Tim is the... Um, kind of shut in a uh, game player sort of uh, computer whiz, but also a dinosaur lover at best. So I'm glad they kept that with Tim because that was his uniqueness to him. That was his unique side to his character. 
Uh, but not before we, uh, of course, meet uh, Muldoon, Henry Wu. Henry Wu, I quite liked his character in this because um, it kind of showed that he wanted to like prove himself in the world. And, you know, um, Hammond kind of exploited that with him, basically saying, you know, you could make something of yourself if like you come work for me. We could like make uh, the children of the world really happy for something like that. And uh, he even asked him, like, what would you like? And he said, is it able to, am I able to, um, you know, progress my work? Like, am I allowed to, like, screen it from the tops of the skyscrapers in the world, basically? And he's basically saying, not yet, but soon, basically. So he's kind of, like, baiting him in with, like, that um, whole sense of bravado that most people tend to uh, seek. You know, uh, Wu wants to, like, make his mark on the world in a certain sense. And I love uh, one of Ian's, uh, Ian Malcolm's line in this uh, book. But basically what he says with uh, Henry, he says that um, you want to make your mark on the world. So basically what you're doing is just scarring Mother Nature itself, basically. So I class that as rape as the nat I class that as rape of the natural world, basically. And uh, that's a very uh, good line because in a certain sense, he's basically saying that because you're fucking with genetics and you're screwing with genomes, you are basically destroying your own ecosystem and everything around it because you are bringing another um, environment into your own, basically. So, uh, yeah, that's... I'm kind of liking that Ian has his own little side bit where he's constantly reminding people of that, but, um, yeah, it did get a little bit repetitive, like, when you're, like, um, 300 pages in and, you know, we already know, like, okay, they fucked up, you don't need to keep reminding us. But, again, you know, they won't listen. It's just, you know, it's so you just keep, so it's like they need constant reminding, basically, of the um, stuff that's gone down. Now, Muldoon, uh, Muldoon is easily my favourite character in this series because I like that his uh, persona does not change throughout the book. He stays exactly the same as he is, basically. You know, he's a very hardened uh, bloke. I believe he's uh, either Australian or Kiwi. And um, he's uh, worked, basically, as... Um, a hunter in a certain sense uh, around different zoos uh, he got asked by uh, Hammond to um, you know act as a gamekeeper of some kind and a hunter or well, mainly for security reasons although uh, I sorry I got the gamekeeping part wrong that goes to um, Harding if you've ever played uh, the Telltale game Jurassic Park you'll know who Harding is and of course uh, Lost World apparently it's been proven that Sarah Harding is uh, apparently uh, this Harding in this book's um, daughter which is uh, I don't know if that's canon or not, but I will need to check that out, to be honest. And um, we have this one chap who I believe they switched roles or like one role was added. And in the film, he was not added. Um, Ed Regis is, uh, if you know the lawyer from um, Jurassic Park, that was actually meant to be Ed Regis's character in this. He's basically um, the cowards that left uh, Lex and Tim on their own when the T-Rex attacked, basically. And um, uh, Gennaro, or Gennaro, I'll just call him uh, Gen from now on, is basically the lawyer who is uh, meant to be coming in and checking the, um, the um, site out, basically. He's meant to be checking the amusement park out to make sure that it's safe. Uh, now, I will admit that he does, like, want this place to succeed. Like, he doesn't want to, like, uh, tick Hammond's safety regimes uh, uh, down unless you know, he's 100% sure that this place is safe. He's, like, hoping this place is safe so he can make, uh, like, a big buck out of it. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, completely thrown out all over the place, really, because Ed Regis, I believe, uh, came with Lex and Tim just to, like, take care of them in a certain sense. We'll move on to um, the T-Rex paddock scene because it's quite unique, actually. Uh, Ed Regis, like, leaves the car. Uh, Gennaro, I believe, is with um, Statler, who... Actually, there's a nice change to um, the tri Triceratops scene where um, uh, where Emily's basically um, healing the Triceratops. It's not a Triceratops. In the book, it's actually a Stegosaurus, which is a nice little change, actually, because um, the Triceratops actually became um, quite a famous herbivore after the film. And uh, I guess people... I guess Steven Spielberg wanted to, like, save the Stegosaur for, like... Um, uh, the next film because the baby in the next film actually uh was given the name ralph by the crew also after uh lex named one of the stegosaurs in uh, the book which was uh, quite a nice touch really 
Uh, I don't like Lex's character, to be honest. Like, um, I know she's only a child, I know she's only eight, but she kind of, like, constantly, like... She has, like, a dry wit humour, I'll give her that. Like, um, she says it how it is, she's very honest when she needs to be, and I like that about uh, Lex's character. But she just snaps at things without, like, giving them, like, uh, the full rundown of things. But again, she's a child, so I'll just let that off with her. Uh, Tim, basically... Uh, his parents are going through a divorce and all that, so um, it's quite hard on him, really. He's having to deal with that. Lex uh, is is missing her um, father, in a certain sense. Uh, you know, she's young. She doesn't understand what's going on with the whole divorce thing and all that. But, um, yeah, it's a little sideline to basically add in the cliches of, like, uh, the torn relationship between the two siblings. And then it, you know, gets better as uh, the story goes on. And there are some other scenes that were added in. Uh, well, of course, it's the original uh, that weren't added into the film, I'm sorry, where uh, after the attack with um, the T-Rex and everything in general, uh, they, I believe Lex, Tim and uh, Dr. Grant basically get on a raft and then they make their way downstream. And with that, they are trying to, like sneak past the t-rex that is sleeping but uh lex coughs unfortunately and it's quite a funny scene as well when she coughs because she's just constantly screaming at them by basically saying i'm sorry i didn't mean it i didn't mean it i didn't mean it <laughs> and grunt's like okay shut up now shut up you'll it will alert him you'll wake him up stop it and uh they end up like coming to quite a large lake area as they're going through uh, the streams, making their way down towards the ocean at least. And uh, the dinosaur is, um, I mean, this is a good eight ton uh, dinosaur in my mind. The T-Rex is quite a large beast. It's a very large muscular creature. And uh, we're meant to believe that they don't swim, but they do. Powerful legs and all, they're able to kick themselves in and out of the water with a good rapid pace. And then it starts to snake its way through the water, kind of like how a crocodile would have done. And I like that touch that uh, Michael threw in there, like the, um, well, of course, because uh, crocodiles were from the Triassic period, hence our sharks as well. And the way they swim is exactly the same way, or, you know, from the left and right wing as most fishes do. And what's interesting about uh, the attack with the T-Rex uh, during the paddock scene when you know Nedry's like took in the embryos and then um sodded off with them is that he doesn't learn to like um he doesn't learn the idea of like you know basically staying still will um make you invisible to the t-rex because in the film he immediately tells ian you know keep perfectly still his vision's based on movement while in this it takes the t-rex uh to trash lex and tim's car uh to throw ian a good few feet away and then for grant to just freeze himself he's just frozen he's just just standing there in shock for the t-rex to then start looking at him with one eye and then the other that's when he starts to realize that oh he's he can't see me and the way the t-rex is roaring to like make him move in a certain sense that was a nice touch what michael threw in there it kind of shows that uh, the t-rex knows it's there but it can't see him in a certain sense also ed reed just survives this attack he doesn't uh die uh his death comes later on when uh he's found when um lex and tim are found by um grant and uh, the interesting thing about Tim with that tree scene was that um, he was actually a good climber. He liked to climb trees, but in the uh, film, they basically made out that, you know, he didn't like uh, trees and he didn't have a tree house or of any kind, which was a, a nice little touch there, here and there. Uh, basically, Ed is uh, going over in his head how much of a coward he was and so on and so forth. He, like, goes out to find the children after he hears them, but then he goes back in towards the tree again because uh, there is a small juvenile T-Rex moving around the area. So uh, they had like a little sheet in the book where it told you the population of the dinosaurs. And uh, because everyone thought that they were female, they couldn't breed and all that. And of course, thanks to the um, West African frog genome, they were able uh, to switch their sexes due to the um, West African frog being a parthenogenesis type of um, uh, amphibian. 
which obviously means that it could just change its gender at any point if like the occasion arose to it basically so uh, there was uh, one big T-Rex and one juvenile T-Rex uh, the juvenile T-Rex manages to get hold of Ed it's just constantly playing with him basically and I like uh, Michael's uh, writing in this particular bit because I believe he says uh, uh, how cute or something like that that uh, poor thing like he's adding like uh, the pittancy to um, Ed's character because of how cowardly he is and uh, the fact that the juvenile is just playing with him and that's also a scene taken, uh, that's actually the original scene from um, uh, Lost World, where uh, Ludlow gets um, jumped by uh, the T-Rex's um, child. Which, uh, it was nice that they added that in to uh, the Lost World for the um, book reader fans and all that. So yeah, and I also want to read a nice little uh, bit here that leads to Nedry's downfall. I should bookmark these, to be honest. Oh, where are you? Because the interesting thing about the Dilophosaurus is that, uh, which is probably my third favourite dinosaur in uh, the whole series of Jurassic Park, um, is that it wasn't uh, representative. Pro it wasn't represented properly in a certain sense. It never had the frill. It never like spat venom, and it wasn't like maybe four to five feet tall it was actually 10 feet tall it was actually um, a type of uh, thoropod in a certain sense kind of like the allosaurus it was not like the size of a velociraptor or a eutoraptor or a dinonychus in a certain sense but it was much more bigger at least like an allosaurus's size and all that let's see so search i can't seem to find the page wait is this it park no because it has like these sections where it like switches from different people's perspectives really um i can't seem to find it but when i do i'll let you guys know but yeah basically as uh it goes on really uh it's shown that within the story of uh, Jurassic Park that uh, each character has their own forms of development where Gennaro basically has like um, a bond with uh, Muldoon where he like, uh, Muldoon is like trying to like make a tougher man out of Gennaro by basically saying to him, you know, come with me, let's go get uh, the rockets and all that to like, you know, take down the T-Rex and all that. And um, it's kind of funny really because uh, there's actually this one scene like at the end of the book where... Um, they're like trying to count the population of the dinosaurs, like the raptors in a certain sense. Muldoon's basically saying to um, Genera, all right, get down there and count. You know, I can't because my leg is busted. He's like, no, I'd rather die than uh, go down there. And he's like, well, I have this prod. Now it could possibly make uh, most dinosaurs uh, excrement all over themselves. They might, feel a very large uh, jolt, although that's a dinosaur. Compared to a human though, you are much, much smaller. Would you like to take that chance? That's just, uh, that's what I like Molden's character, just the way he is really with that. Ah, here we are, the chapter, okay. I'll do a short read. Okay. I'll go, I'll do to the point where um, Nedry is basically uh, attacked by the Dilophosaurus. The dinosaur stared at him and then snapped its head in a swift motion. Nedry felt something smack wetly against his chest. He looked down and saw a dripping blob of foam on his rain-soaked shirt. He touched it curiously, not comprehending. It was spit. The dinosaur had spit on him. It was creepy. He had thought. He looked back at the dinosaur and saw the head snap again, and immediately felt another wet smack against his neck, just above the shirt collar. He wiped it away with his hand. Jesus, that was disgusting. But the skin of his neck was already starting to tingle and burn, and his hand was tingling too. It was almost like he had been touched with acid. Nedry opened the car door, glancing back at the dinosaurs to make sure it wasn't going to attack. 
and it felt a sudden excruciating pain in his eyes, like stabbing spikes in the back of his head. And he squeezed his eyes shut and gasped with the intensity of it, and threw up his hands to cover his eyes, and it felt slippery from all the foam trickling down both sides of his nose. Spit, the dinosaur had spat in his eyes. Even if he had realised it, the pain overwhelmed him, and he dropped to his knees, disorientated, wheezing. He collapsed onto his side, his cheek pressed to the wet ground, his breath coming in, thin whistles through the constant, ever screaming pain that caused flashing spots of light to appear behind his tightly shut his tightly shut eyelids. The earth shook beneath him, and Edgar knew the dinosaur was moving. He could hear its soft hooting cry and despite the pain he forced his eyes open, and still he saw nothing but flashing spots against black. Slowly the realization came to him. He was blind. The hooting was louder as Medri scrambled to his feet and staggered back against the side panel of the car. As a wave of nausea and dizziness swept over him, the dinosaur was close. He could feel it coming close. He was dimly aware of the snorting breath but he couldn't see. He couldn't see anything, and his terror was extreme. He stretched out his hands, waving them wildly in the air to ward off the attack he knew was coming. And then there was a new searing pain, like a fiery knife in his belly. Nedry stumbled, reaching blindly down to touch the ragged edge of his shirt, and then a thick, slippery mass that was surprisingly warm, and with horror, he suddenly knew he was holding his own intestines. In his hands, the dinosaur had torn him open. His guts had fallen out. Nedry fell to the floor and landed on something scaly and cold. It was the animal's foot. And then there was a new pain on both sides of his head. The pain grew worse. And then his head was in his jaws. And the horror of that realisation was followed by one final wish. That it would all be ended soon. That is my favourite uh, um, part of this book, really, with uh, Nedry. Well, at least to read, it's because it adds like the nice little horror aspect to it, like the small details to like his death. It's more gruesome in this than it is in the um, actual film because it cuts off from the attack when the Dilophosaurus um, attacks him in his car, and it's it, it never even takes place in the car. It actually takes place a good ten feet from the car. He at least tries to get to the car, but he never makes it. Uh, so yes, there are also some small little touches with, uh, like, the, uh, population of the, um, raptors. Like, in the film, we only see two or three raptors. In, uh, this, there's at least 37 or 38 raptors, most of them juvenile or infants, and at least, uh, four to six adults. Uh, the infants, uh, if you've ever seen, uh, Jurassic Park, uh, uh sorry, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, go watch that, it's very good. It's uh, not a bad uh, uh, sequel to uh, the uh, Jurassic World film. It's not bad, actually. I quite enjoyed it. Uh, basically, uh, it kind of like shows the behaviour of uh, the young infants, basically. How... Uh, well, you probably... S basically, it's not really much of a spoiler. That Blue basically takes kindly to um, Owen's character, really. And... Um, you know, he, like, it shows interest in Owen, like, it shows curiosity and all that. Something that all these, um, infants do, basically. It's basically their way of imprinting on the first thing they see. So, uh, that's always been a nice, interesting, uh, little thing. And, uh, yes, I want to end off with, uh, I won't, uh, give too much away with the book. But I will give away one person's, uh, death. And that is, uh, unfortunately, Hammond. John Hammond, of course. Uh, it's at this point when he's just screaming to himself. He's basically saying everyone is wrong. You know, he could have done better. Like, he blamed Wu for basically, um, you know, like, trying to change the dinosaurs, like, to make them uh, more docile in a certain sense, you know, because he believed that... Uh, you know, like, screwing with nature itself was uh, wrong in a certain sense, that they should be natural. Although, again, he's contradicting himself by bringing something back from well over 150 million years ago. It's just unbelievable. The fact that 
Hammond is just such a selfish, horrible, pathetic man in the book. And he meets his way in a very unique way as well. He like tries to go back towards his bungalow. And um, there's like a roar of the T-Rex uh, across the horizon. Uh, a workman runs past him and he runs as well. But he trips and falls down uh, a hill. And uh, he waits there a good hour at least. He's after, he, after he's figured out he's broken his ankle basically. And... Um, what he finds out is that um, the noise of the Tyrannosaurus was actually um, a call that they had on one of the sirens that the kids were playing with, that Lex and Tim were playing with. And uh, they used that basically to like scare some herbivores into um, enclosures and all that. But the kids were just playing around with it and uh, that's what caused um, Hammond to like fall down the hill because he thought that there was a T-Rex around. And even uh, shows distaste to the children. He's like, uh, in the book, he's like, those damned kids, I should never really brought them there. I should have never brought them here and all that. And uh, that's when I really started to hate um, Hammond's character because in the movie, he's a very sweet, uh, kind-hearted um, gentleman who just wants like the world and children to see the magnificence of uh, dinosaurs. And, uh, you know, he learns his lesson in the film. You know, he basically uh, is able to, like, go on in the second film and basically say, you know, I would like to protect these dinosaurs now. You know, I want it to, like, I would like Nublar to be, like, a, sort of like a reservation, like, um, a reserve, basically, for all dinosaurs. You know, because in the film, he had some character to him. Like, he, he developed and he grew as a person, basically. But in the book, he's just... A sad old man who's just caught up on everyone else basically being like blamed for you know everything that happened basically but uh, yeah he meets his end with uh, a few compies that surrounds him basically and of course uh, compies are known as scavengers but they will take down prey that they believe is crippled ironic really the fact that he's broken his ankle and now he's running from uh, these uh, little scavengers and all that and uh they also made a, a good point at the beginning of the book to basically say that the infant mortality rate at the beginning was quite high due to the fact that an awful lot of compies had gotten off the island and gotten to uh some of the uh, off the coasts of costa rica and uh, that explains why most infant deaths have been on the high rise recently but anyway yes back to hammond uh He's attacked by the compies. He, there are like nips at his neck, on his fingers, all over his body basically. And he starts to go numb. He st starts to go limp and all that. And uh, it's kind of like a beautiful death in a certain sense because everything's slowed down for Hammond. He, he's, feel, he's feeling relaxed. He doesn't like feel um, the pain that's about to ensue onto him. And it ends with um, the compi jump, one of the compies jumping on his chest. And then um, it takes a nip at his neck, basically. And then it just cuts off there. And, uh, yeah, that's unfortunately the end of, um, of uh, John Hammond, basically, in the book. In the screenplay, though, if you've seen the screenplay, he actually um, redeems himself he actually comes back and becomes, you know, like a better character out of it because he loves his grandchildren so much that he saves them by um, distracting the velociraptors from the kitchen to the auditorium where he's, like, you know, like explaining the whole um, idea of, like, DNA on dinosaurs and where they came from and all that. So at least... Uh, and he also, like, walked into the auditorium to um, lock it from the inside so... That way the kids were safe, basically. The door could only be like locked from the inside for some odd reason. Like You don't have a key that can do that from the outside, but yeah. Hammond sacrificed himself uh, for the two children uh, against the uh, two velociraptors, basically. So, you know, I like that in the screenplay he was able to redeem himself that way. Whereas in the film he survives, which is also a nice touch. But um, yeah, the screenplay did uh, Hammond well. Like, they... Uh, did Hammond's character nicely. But yeah, in this, he's just given a very um, 
he's given a very, he's given a very gruesome death, uh, and so rightly so. And uh, what's interesting is that some uh, characters that I believe died in the film actually survived, or some weren't in some particular places were rather than others. Like as in, Alan Grant basically was the one who turned the power back on the whole. Um, well, you know, the whole uh, button pressing scene, that was Alan, basically, instead of um, of uh, Emily Statler. But, uh, yeah, it was an interesting read, to be honest. Uh, I managed to have myself a good four-day break to uh, catch up on this, and, uh, yeah, I definitely enjoyed it. And, again, it's very, very, uh, very nice to, like, get the... Um, original like work in my own mind really because i like grew up with jurassic park i grew up with walking with dinosaurs like i know as much as i'd like to about dinosaurs and i would like to learn more really it's nice that in our world you know we're constantly learning new things and especially with this book like i've learned that you know there are some interesting new little uh things within the book that i never knew and i never realized but yeah anyway I'd definitely suggest going to pick this book up. Michael Crichton's a fantastic writer, uh, of course. I mean, so many people have fallen in love with dinosaurs because of his work. Granted, some of uh, the facts in this are false, and he even states it at the back of the book that it is a work of fiction at the end of the day. But again, I enjoyed it, and hopefully you guys will. Please go and pick up the book. It's definitely a good read. But anyway, that is all I have for you guys today. I will continue my uh, daily uploads uh, from now, now on. Hopefully I shall have no game of no life up tomorrow as well. And um, as a special treat for uh, all you uh, dinosaur fans out there, and of course me being a dinosaur fan, I'm actually going to start playing um, Jurassic Park, uh, uh, well, Jurassic World Evolution basically, which is uh, I think every single Jurassic Park Operation Genesis um, wet dream, basically. I mean, I even played Operation Genesis when I was young, and I absolutely loved it. I loved the idea of, like, building uh, the amusement park and, um, you know, trying to deal with uh, the dinosaurs every day-to-day, -day on their day-to-day -day basis and all that. So, yes, um, I will not be playing that until the 3rd of July because I want to get the um, physical copy. I don't like to get digital copies because I feel like... Uh, you know, if they're not, like, up to scratch, then, you know, I cannot, like, hand them back in for something like that. Not that I'd hand Jurassic Park back in, but, you know, I'd like to at least have a little bit of evidence to say, you know, this is the physical copy, this is this is mine, so on and so forth. But yeah, anyway. Anyway, until uh, my next review, or whatever it is I do on this channel, I hope you all have a lovely, fantastic, and a beautiful day. Take care, my friends.